Harris. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to present here. I'm very happy and excited. Um, so this work, I did it with my co-authors, Andreas Ehrenmann, also from NG Impact, and Xavier Lambin from the Grenoble Ecole de Management in France. And in this research, we have tried to look at the economics of what we call energy communities in Europe, and I'll give a clearer definition on this concept later on. And maybe most importantly, we tried to, to see whether there is a way to make these communities economically stable and happy, and to see whether uh, some there is some kind of snowball effect in the interaction between these communities and the DSO or the distribution system operator when we put them in the context in the context of a whole system. So when we take into account the externalities that they might have on the system operator. All right, so maybe let's let's start by some context. Why are we interested in these energy communities? It is mainly because of the fact that the European authorities are giving them more and more regulatory power. Um, because they believe that these energy communities are going to play an important role in the energy transition through the decentralization and the digitalization of the energy that is going to be produced by these energy communities. Uh, they believe that these communities are going to provide some flexibility in the system. They're going to lead to uh, some avoided investment costs, at least in the production capacity part. I'm not talking about the infrastructure here because we know that they're not going to reduce the peak consumption. But at least um, because these communities are also going probably to invest in some battery and storage devices, they might also increase the capacity of DSM or demand side management in the system. So it's it's a kind of a hot topic, at least from the European Commission point of view. And they are, there is clearly a will to empower these initiatives and these energy communities. And indeed, there is also legal framework <clears throat> in the so-called winter package that defines and clearly set boundaries um, on the functioning of these energy communities and the interaction they might have with the DSO. Um, we're not going to do a lot of, of legal work here. We're going to look at the economics of these energy communities, but it is sufficient maybe to say that there are here today two separate laws defining these communities. You have the renewable energy communities, and maybe the most important is the citizen energy communities. But overall, the idea is to make these entities like a single entity that is going to interact with the DSO. And so to, to bring everything to economics, um, what we are going to consider here in our research is a kind of definition that tries to fit a little bit uh, what we find on the concept of energy communities in the winter package. So for us, an energy community is going to be composed by several households uh, living in a common neighborhood. It's going to be typically a building here, and they're going to decide to mutualize their efforts and to invest in a common PV capacity, eventually with some batteries, and they are going to interact as a single meter, as a single prosumer um, with respect to the, to the DSO. And once you put the frame and this definition, um, question that, draw, that drives our work is the question of stability. So uh, ideally, when you form an energy community, you, you create some value. And we wanted to see whether there is some economic value first in the creation of such an energy community. And if so, and if any, is this value going to be split among the members of this energy community in a fair, efficient and stable way so that everyone is happy to remain within the ground energy community. And this is important because today there is no way to force anyone or any sub coalition or any uh, group of households to remain and to stay in the community. If people are not happy, they always have the, the possibility to opt out and form another community on their own, for instance. So in the way the value is split among the members of the energy community, we want to make everyone happy to stay in the grand energy community. And this is our first research question. Are there some simple and efficient sharing rules of the value, if any, that allow the community to be stable in the long term? And then the second research question is going, to, as I said, to look at the interaction between 
these um, energy communities and the DSO with the objective to capture all the externalities that these communities might create on the system. So the idea here is that the um, in the interaction between the DSO and these communities, there is there might be some snowball effect, and I'll define this later on. But the idea here is maybe by adjusting his grid tariffs so that he can always recover his cost as a reaction to the formation. The DSO other energy communities to, to appear and to pop in the system, which might maybe generate an over adoption of the system and maybe over investments uh, in the system. And we want to see whether there are some simple means for the DSO to limit this snowball effect or these interactions or sorry, or these uh, over investments. And we do that by looking at the tariff structure, the tarification structure of the DSO. There is uh, a lot of literature um, dedicated to all these questions. I think you already know that we're going to talk a lot about game theory because I already talked about stability of and, and all these questions of value sharing. So there is um, a stream of literature dedicated to the application of co cooperative game theory to economic systems and most importantly to electricity. Uh, markets. Um, there is also all the literature dedicated to the decentralized and digitalized energy systems that is also in line with, with what we try to do. And maybe most importantly on the question of efficient tarification, there is also a lot of literature in the US and in the Europe on how on an efficient way um, to tariff grid charges, for instance, so that you can ensure the equity and efficiency of your system. So it's also related to, to all this literature there. Um, <clears throat> so this is the outline of my presentation. I will try to to keep it like to, to 30 minutes as I agreed on. So I will the first part we look at the allocation rules and to see whether there are some simple ways to share the value of an energy community. Is going to look at all these externalities and the optimal tarification schemes by the DSO, and then I will show you some results before before concluding. OK, so if you look at the potential today of these energy communities, it appears to be big. So the European Commission estimates in a recent publication that today there are more than 3,500 renewable, active renewable energy communities in Europe. I give you here uh, some examples of these initiatives that are uh, ongoing and working today. Um, and, and on the right, you can see how all these 3,500 are split among the main uh, European countries. Um, and you see that Germany is quite ahead. Roughly 50% of these communities are already located in Germany. But the good news for these communities is that the trend indicates an increase. Today, the European Council estimates by 2030, 38% of the installed capacity could be owned by individuals and by energy communities. So, you know, there is a, at least maybe it's an upper bound, but at least there is a great potential to increase the decentralization of the system of the electricity system through these energy communities. OK, so as I said, what we are going to consider in this paper in, is a standard definition, definition of an energy community. These all are people, as I said, living in a neighborhood. It's going to be a building in all the numerical applications that we are going to show you. So it's going to be a rooftop PV. But they decide to form a community. They decide together to invest mutually in a PV capacity with eventually some battery. And then they can also decide how to interact with the DSO. So usually what happens is that they still keep a subscription because they are not 100% independent. They still need a connection to the, to, to the grid um, because they might inject some electricity if there is too much PV production and not enough storage capacity, for instance, or withdraw electricity from the grid if there is not enough PV production, right? So there is still the interaction with the DSO. So in our base model, we are going to call I the uh, set of households uh, that might join the energy community. In the interaction with the DSO, we assume that the DSO here has two levers to recover his cost. So the grid chargers have two components, a fixed component that we are going to call delta and a capacity based component. OK. Um, and based on these, 
uh, we can estimate and actually all the amount of and, and the profiles of consumption of all the individuals and also the amount of auto consumption that is going to be calculated in the slide afterwards. We can calculate if there is some value in the creation of the energy community. So this slide here defines what we call the value of creation of an energy community that we call S. So S is a standard you know, name of an energy community that is going to be composed by all the households I that I've shown that I've shown you before. So I hope that you see my my mouse here. Um, but what we do here is split the total value into different components that I'm going to explain now. So the first component is what we call the aggregation benefit. It's typically what it's, it's a free writing benefit. So it's typically how much you're going to reduce your bill that you pay to the DSO by creating your energy community. So this is why there is a difference here. It's when you create the energy community and without creating the energy community. OK, so this is how much you earn on the capacity based tariff that I called alpha here. And this is how much you earn by free riding on the fixed charge tariff that I called delta here. So overall here, the aggregation benefit is aggregation because it, it's typically what happens when you mitigate the maximum capacity when you, you join all your profiles together. Maybe what I didn't explain here is what we call FI here is simply the typical profile of consumption of individual I here. FI that depends on time. Time can have different granularities in all our uh, simulations. It's going to be hourly, but it can be, you know, depending on the grid tariffs and the structure, etc. It can have different granularities, but T is, you know, is going to be discretized. It's going to represent time. FI is the load profile. So this is the aggregation benefit here. This is what we call the self-consumed PV. So it's the amount of a reduction of your bill that you pay to the utility, for instance, that is going to be decreased because you produce part of the electricity that you are going to consume. Now, this production here is, is determined by this term here. J is the irradiance profile that is also time dependent, presenting a peak to about 12 p.m. And this is the decision variable. This is going to define the amount of PV that you're going to invest in order to produce part of your consumption, right? So depending on the uh, on the tariff you have on the, your electricity bill, it can be time dependent that we call beta here. It can be time. Usually it's time dependent, but it can be constant. You can calculate how much you can decrease your bill uh, on the volume that you're going to be to consume here. This term here is the feed in tariff. So it's the amount of PV of overproduction uh, as compared to your consumption here. Uh, that you're going to inject in the system uh, and that you're going to receive at the feed-in tariff. So it can be fixed, but usually today it's not fixed in most of the European countries. It's, it's, depend, it's indexed on the spot market, so this is why it can depend on, on, on time. T. And obviously you need also to subtract from what you gain, what you're going to pay, and this is the PV cost. And as I said, this is the capacity that you're going to invest. Um, and so this is a that is uh, <clears throat> usually concave because you, you have some economies of scale. But the idea here is that we are going to assume that the people that want to join an energy community are going to do it based on some economic considerations. We know that this is not true. There are other considerations that have to be taken into account. But what we assume here is that this value will have to be maximized. So the decision variable is how much investment you're going to consider. So the capacity of PV you're going to build. You have all this data, this um, profile of consumption, all the grid charges and the electricity bill, and the electricity uh, volume tariff. You have the feed-in tariff, the cost structure, and you optimize everything so that this value is maximized. We have a typical constraint on the um, PV capacity because usually what happens in rooftop PV is that you have a <laughs> finite roof, so you cannot invest infinitely. So we, we limit the investment capacity by, by an upper bound. So as I said, there are other considerations, for instance, the willingness to go green, the willingness to be independent that have to be taken into account. You can do that by considering other utility functions. Here we consider an economic utility function. All right, so what happens is that if you consider an energy community, a grand energy community that we call I here, you might wonder if you create some value, how are you going to share this value among all the members of the energy community? 
And this is a typical game theory, cooperative game theory problem. And we are going to say that an allocation of the total value here is going to be stable in the sense that everyone is going to be happy if it belongs to the core of the game. And the core of the cooperative game is defined as follow, is the set of the different allocation rules here that are going to split all the value created by the grand coalition here. So it's, it's a Pareto opti optimality property here. Um, so this is uh, quite basic. But what we imposed also is that every sub coalition of the grand coalition, so every subset of the grand coalition I should receive more than what it has if it creates a community on its own. So it holds also for individual consumers or individual prosumers, right? We want individuals to be happy, but also sub coalitions. We want to share the value so that everyone and every sub coalition is happy and no one is going to complain at some point. And this is how we define the uh, stability of the system. Now, when we talk about um, allocation rules in game theory, all the people usually think about the Shapley value, which is a standard allocation rule that can be applied in our system. And we have a bunch of theoretical results in our paper that show and find conditions under which this allocation rule is in the core. It is actually linked to the convexity of the game and the convexity of the cost function. But we have some um, some theorems and unresolved theoretical results in our in our paper that try to find conditions under which the core is non-empty. If the core is non-empty, it means that the community, it, it is, this is a good news because the community might be stable. And we also find conditions under which the Shapley value is going to be in the core or not. We also define in the paper a third allocation rule that is interested. It's what we call the mean var. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but the idea is to minimize the insatisfaction. So if the core is non-empty, we try to find the best allocation, the optimal allocation rule that is going to minimize the variance of payoffs among all the payoffs that you give to the all to all the households. Okay, so again, we have some theoretical results, but maybe well that impose some some conditions on the profiles on their correlations, etc. But maybe to have something maybe more realistic, we resort we have to resort to numerical applications, and this is what we have done. So we try to look at um, because, as we said, it's it's basically happening in Germany today. So we looked at what happens in Germany, and <clears throat> we tries. We, tr we, we try to understand if uh, the core is empty or not for standard buildings. So we simulated a bunch of buildings, uh, either with heterogeneous consumption profiles or maybe more homogeneous, to see whether first there is some value and, and if the core is non empty. And most importantly, we want to know whether simple allocation rules that are probably going to be implemented by uh, the energy community managers. Um, are in the core or not, whether they ensure stability, long-term stability of the system, of the energy community or not. And for that purpose, we look at the per capita allocation rule, the pro rata of volume allocation rule. So you just allocate the value pro rata of consumption, pro rata of peak demand. And we look at if the Shapley value and if the main var are in the core or not. <clears throat> so this is, so again, we have some results, but I, I want to focus on one particular building. Uh, again, it's applied for Germany. Um, and so this is the composition of the building. We have six apartments with six typical households. And you see here that it's quite heterogeneous. We have different consumption profiles. We also have a storekeeper. Um, um, a storekeeper in, in, in the basement, for instance. Uh, we in weekends and then holidays, for instance. So it's so so that the uh, what I want to say is that the ag aggregation benefit of the value is going to be big in this building, which means that the value is going to be non-negligible and and quite positive, which is the case here. Um, <clears throat> so maybe uh, the good news is that for this energy community, if it forms, then the core is non-empty. So there is quite a big chance that the um, this community is going to be stable if you find the adequate allocation rules. If you test the per capita allocation rule, you see, and actually all the simple allocation rules per capita, per volume, and per capacity, they are not in the core, which means that at some point, one individual or one subgroup of people are going to be unhappy and understand that they might, might earn more by creating another energy community. The good news is that more complex allocation rules are like Shapley and Mirvar are usually always in the core. And it's it's quite standard and it's quite, quite common for all the realistic buildings that we have simulated, right? Maybe the other good news also is that 
if the will of the um, European Commission is to increase the penetration of re decentralized renewables in the systems via these energy communities, then we see that indeed, in comparison with individual prosumers for this building, you increase the amount of PV that is going to be installed here within the Grand Coalition. Okay. Um, okay, so, so again, maybe to summarize here on this first uh, research quite quickly, what we see is that there is, there might be some value to create an energy community that is basically driven by the aggregation benefit and the auto consumption benefits. But the way this value is shared can influence a great deal the stability of the energy community. And what we show is that, and even we can show it theoretically, is that simple allocation rules usually are not the main driver of the economic a creation, the economic value creation of each individuals or of each hot walls. So if you look at the volume, if you look at the capacity, it's not enough to represent how much each individual is bringing to the community. So if you want to be honest and fair, you need to give more value to the individual that is creating the most of the value. For instance, if you have someone that has a peak consumption around 12 p uh, 12 a.m for instance it means that you have to give him a great part of the value because he is helping the system consuming when the pv production is producing a lot right and when you do that when you use simple allocation rules you are not satisfying the core conditions and you are making the community unstable um now the problem is that if you want to have something stable you need to do something more complicated like the Shapley. And here we have to arbitrage between simply and simplicity and efficiency, right? Um, when we when we present the Shapley value to you know economics and people involved um, in in these uh, even people in the European Commission when we when we did the study for them they say it's complicated it's not going to be implemented like that by energy managers so we did a great deal to try to simplify simplify the uh, you know the formulation of the Shapley value and and come up we, we've come up with simple alloc like you know uh, simpler than Shapley allocation rules. Uh, requiring less calculations, but you know, still complicated because you really need to understand the fact that you calculate and need to calculate marginal contribution of each household to a certain number of coalitions. So this is why we recommend that there is a great effort that should be done by the European authorities to first educate community managers on these importance of equity and stability of energy communities on the long term communicate on the existence of research and of stable allocation rules that you know make people happy so there exist we know we have tested that they are complicated but still they exist and maybe why not elaborate uh, make uh, participate the uh, private sector sector to create create some software for instance that automatically calculates the sharing rule um, with smart metering, for instance, right? Uh, we have similar solutions for other sectors like the banking. Uh, if you want to buy an apartment or a house, you need to, to contract a loan. Um, you, you're not, um, if you don't have a financial advisor, for instance, but you can simulate how much interest rate you're going to require, how much annuities you're going to pay, and you do that on a software on the internet, for instance. So why not imagine something similar for um, the energy communities if we want to stabilize them on the long term? All right, before moving to the second part, um, just a reminder, we have looked at here an energy community on its own. We didn't look at what we call the energy, what, what we call the externalities. And an externality happens because if, and, and I told the world before, it's free riding, if you pay less, to the grid operator, you are free riding on the system because the grid operator has to recover some cost. If you have some grid charges, it means that there are some investments, some maintenance to be paid by to, and to be performed by the DSO, and he has to recover. So less paying energy communities naturally will increase tariffs for everyone. So if you have one community, this is negligible. But if you start, you know, 38% of your renew decentralized um, production. It means that you need to anticipate a lot of energy communities in the future. And in that problem, in that case, there might be a snowball effect problem in the interaction between the energy communities, the system via grid tariffs. So what we call the snowball is a quite it's a kind of death spiral effect. So given the existing grid tariffs, for instance, you might have some energy communities that 
you know, pop out in the neighborhood. You have one or two energy communities, fine. But given now the creation of these energy communities, and if they produce a lot, then the DSO, because he has a cost recovery constraint, has to increase his grid tariffs to everyone. If you have a pair equation, for instance, constraint. And if you do that as a reaction, people start will start complaining that the grid charges are now increasing. And people might find it now profitable, other new people find it profitable to create new energy communities on their own, which will also eventually increase the grid charges as a reaction to that because of the grid recovery cost recovery constraint, right? So you end up in this kind of death spiral or what we call the snowball effect. And the idea now of this research is try to model it and to simulate it to see whether this is problematic or not and whether, most importantly, the DSO has some levers to mitigate it. All right, so this is the setting. We are going to consider a neighborhood of a certain number of buildings. And in each building, energy communities might form, but not necessarily. And not only one, it can be two or three. But the important condition that we're going to put here is that if an energy community is going to form, it has to be stable in the sense of cooperative games that we have defined before, right? The core has to be non-empty and there are some stable, even complicated, but at least there are some stable allocation rules for each community that is going to be formed. All right. Um, so we assume that the DSO has three levers to recover his cost. Uh, a fixed part tariff, a capacity based tariff that we call alpha here, so it's like before, but here we add a volume based tariff. So typically, if you have a consumption profile of F of T, this is the yearly amount of money that the DSO is going to recover. All right, now, given a structure of energy communities in the neighborhood or a partition of each building into energy communities that we call P1, P2, PB. Uh, in, in the mathematical definition uh, term, we can calculate how much the DSO is going to earn given this structure of energy communities. So given an energy communities, if you solve the um, optimization problem that I told you about before, uh, you can calculate how much auto consumption is going to be injected, uh, sorry, how much going to be performed by each community, and you can calculate how much um, the capacity fee is going to be for the each energy community and for the total neighborhood of the DSO, the same for the volume and the same for the fix, right? What I mean here is that there is cl a clear link between the structure of energy community and the amount of money that the DSO is going to recover. And then we are going to define a game here, a non-cooperative game between the DSO and the energy communities to re So we're going to, to consider that a partition is optimal in each building or a structure of energy communities is, is optimal in each building if given the grid charges of the DSO, each community of that is formed in each building is going to be stable in the cooperative game theory sense that we made before. And we are going to say that the DSO is happy um, if he can recover the cost given the structure of energy communities that he has you know, in face of him. And we consider now in the no cooperative game sense that the system is at equilibrium if both the energy communities and the DSO are happy. If given the grid charges at the equilibrium, all the energy communities are stable in each building and given the structure of energy communities in the neighborhood, the DSO can still recover his cost. Exactly. All right, maybe we want to simulate this and I still have, I think, five uh, minutes left. So what we did is consider a simple situation where we have two buildings, um, one that is mixed, it's, it's, it's the one that I've shown you before with the storekeeper, and one that is more homogeneous, right? And we try to see whether there is a snowball effect here. So first we assume that the DSO can recover his cost only by playing and adjusting the capacity-based tariff here. It's just for illustration. So we, we fix all the fixed and the um, volume-based tariffs and the DSO plays only with the um, capacity-based fee. And what we show here is the iteration between the DSO. So it's really a description of the snowball effect of the DSO. So it, you, you should see that in columns here and the energy communities before convergence and before the equilibrium. So you know, given an initial grid structure, a grid tariff, you have some energy communities who, who might form in the system. And then as a reaction, the grid 
cost is going to increase and this is what you see here. So with the iteration, the grid cost is going to increase because of the cost recovery constraint. And this is typically what, you know, it has to be like that, what is going to trigger the snowball effect. And this is indeed, this is what you see. You end up at the equilibrium with something non-trivial. You have two energy communities in the first building and three in the second building. You also have a single prosumer here because uh, in, in the second building, right? Because he's not happy and he wants to create an energy community on its own, right? But, you know, the bottom line here is uh, yeah, maybe on the PV capacity also it's the same as before. We see that the PV capacity is going to increase um, with the creation of energy communities. So there is a snowball. There is an increase of PV capacity. Now everyone is happy because the value is stable. We have more PV capacity if, you know, the incentive of the European Commission is to increase. Okay, we have more. But is the system happy? This is the question. Are we seeing really a snowball effect or not? Are we seeing some overinvestments? And to answer to that, we have, you know, to, to run a benchmark and the benchmark is, you know, a perfect, um, a, a social um, welfare maximization where everything is centralized. If the DSO can operate and create energy communities, how he would have done it in a centralized way so that the social welfare is optimal. And then we can compare all the results that we have at the equilibrium with the best welfare, but also with the best um, investment in PV capacity, for instance. And we do that with all the grid charges or all the grid structure that we are going to consider. So either you have a fixed, sorry, it's delta. So either you have a capacity based tariff alpha or a fixed based tariff delta or a volume based tariff fee, right? But we also add some coordination costs that I don't want to talk about a lot here. But the idea here play with the cost structure of the DSO and to see whether we are closer or not at the end to the perfect system. And what happens actually, and then I can go to the, yeah, I can, I don't have a lot of time, but what happens actually is that, sorry, I can see it here. It's, it's actually the structure, maybe it's, sorry, it's better here. It's the structure where you have a high fixed charge component that brings the system the closest possible to the best welfare. You're not at the best welfare because you still have two energy communities. You're not going to form one PV capacity for all the neighborhood, but you still have two roofs, right? But it's the closest possible. And even the um, structure at the equilibrium of is here of the energy communities is maybe the most trivial. You have two energy communities, one per building. Well, obviously, if we could have created one for both buildings, we would have. But what we want to state here is that if you increase the fixed component part, you decrease the incentive to free ride on the system, right? Because if, if you have a high capacity based alpha here and it's something quite intuitive and simple, if you have a high capacity based fee here, people were going to see it and integrate it in their optimization problem and they're going to consider that in their decision to create an energy community to optimize the value. Whereas if it's something fixed, you decrease this incentive, right, to free ride on the system and, and you, um, uh, by a reverse effect, on exogenously take into account the impact that you're going to have on the system by creating too much energy communities. And by the way, it's also the the situation where you in where you decrease a lot the over investments that you're going to have in PV and batteries by doing that. Right. All right. So I, I still have if I still have one minute, Elias, tell me um, to to may, maybe well to conclude and and talk about the limitations. So what we did is embed the cooperative framework that we have defined before in terms of stability of energy communities into a non-cooperative interaction between these communities and the DSO to try to mimic this snowball effect that we, we might see appearing in the system is if like the European Commission wants 38% of capacity is going to be owned by energy communities. And what we see is that there is clearly a risk to have this snowball effect and the DSO has some levers to mitigate that and mitigate these over investments. And one of the lever is to increase the um, fixed capacity component, sorry, the fixed um, fee charge in the uh, charge fees uh, and a little bit decrease the others, not not put them to zero, obviously, but a little bit uh, decrease them. Uh, and this is actually not new and it's in line with uh, what Borenstein finds um, in all his studies of the tarification of the 
um, gas infrastructure. Now, the results there are driven more driven by equity considerations in, in the economic term of in econ economic sense of the term. But here we have the counterparty in terms of value creation for the energy communities and the interaction with the DSO. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, maybe quickly uh, talk about the limitations of, of the work that we are aware of. We have a lot of other positive externalities that we didn't talk about, like the fact that, you know, these energy communities might also relieve the system, create some flexibility in terms of DSM that have to be taken into account, obviously. Here we talk only about the negative externalities. Uh, combinations of grid tariffs in terms of interaction with the DSO are not taken into account. We could do that. Other financial incentives can be considered, for instance, uh, conditions of access to the loan, but we didn't do it. Uh, the illustration is quite simple. Here we have two buildings. Obviously, we need to do it on you know, a realistic neighborhood with many, many, like 20 or even 100 buildings. Uh, well, computationally, it's quite problematic because to compute the Shapley value, for instance, you need to calculate a lot of all the, it's exponential, you, can, you, can, you need to list all the sub-coalitions, but still, you know, if you have a big computer, you can do that. Um, a lot of technicality is linked to the operations of the PV batteries, of the PV and the battery system, like the state of charge conditions and, and some constraints on, on the balance of the battery were not taken into account, but they could be, they could be done in, in our work. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ibrahim, and thank you for trying to keep it on time. Uh, we already have uh, one uh, hand raised by Dimitri. Dimitrios, Dimitrios, sorry. So I'll leave you the floor to answer your, your to ask your question. Sorry. Hi, hi. Thanks for the uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I have basically two questions, but uh, I believe both should be short. Uh, the first one is on the first part regarding the different uh, the comparison between different uh, benefit uh, uh, distribution mechanisms or value allocation mechanisms. I don't know what is the more correct term. Uh, one of the conclusion was that uh, supply value seems to be uh, the most approach. And I wanted to ask to what extent this analysis and the underlying assumptions include uh, time coupling, so um, assets that are characterized by time coupling, such as energy storage, and also whether they include uh, local network constraints. And I'm asking this because uh, some uh, previous work uh, we have done indicates that when you uh, have time coupling characteristics, it could be that the supply value is not always uh, stable uh, in uh, every scenario. Its stability cannot be guaranteed. So just wanted to ask whether uh, this whether you agree with that uh, and whether we need more, uh, even more complex allocation mechanisms to deal with such cases. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So f for the first question, the time correlations and the dynamics are, I believe, taken into account in, in, in here, like when we calculate. Um, so I, I didn't have a lot of time to explain, but well, and again, I simplify that for PV, but the battery is there. Uh, it's, it's not present, but in our work, we have the investment in battery and we have the dynamics of the operations of the battery. Um, and all the time correlations between the uh, different profiles of consumption are taken into account. Now, for the second, unfortunately, we didn't take into account the congestion problem, the local congestion problem. And I totally agree that this might complicate a lot the problem. And it also might complicate and, and even change the results. And I... Uh, honest, <clears throat> honestly, I don't have uh, more intuition than that, except saying that it's going to complicate. Um, I, I don't know whether the Shapley value is going to be out of the core or not when you take into account that. Mm, I don't have a lot of intuition, but I, 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 if you have some literature that I can read on that, I would be happy to have it. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, I can ask a second one. Uh, I mean, regarding the tariffs, regarding the second part, uh, I just wanted to ask, it's a bit open-ended, uh, to what extent uh, there are changes in the tariff structures to account for such energy communities? In other words, do we need different uh, tariff structures 
if such energy community concepts are rolled out because so far you know you have either consumers or generators so you accordingly calculate the uh, volumetric or capacity charts but when you have energy communities that can uh, play both roles demand and uh, supply mm -hmm. uh, do we need to change the tariff structure or what we have now is sufficient thanks yeah this is a this is a fundamental point thank you for the question um and i hope the answer won't be lengthy so there so if there is a dedicated tarification uh, at least in france for what we call the auto consommation right so people are really thinking to uh, charge differently these energy communities at, as compared for instance, and to charge differently the feed-in tariff. And the idea behind this is to increase their, uh, and is to help them. But even maybe more generally, if you look at the tariff structure in France, it's regularly evolving. And what we what we are seeing in the, in the interaction with the, the CRE and, um, and RTU and the NEDIS is that they want to increase well, to, to increase the time granularity, to to, incent, to 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 send maybe to have something maybe more dynamic in the pricing, and to increase the alpha, the capacity based, and to increase the fee and to decrease the fixed. So, what is behind the, these people, and it's totally understandable, is to foster their evolution, so to to send the right signals so that they can invest more. So we're not today the, the snowball effect is 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 really not there, and it's not. It's going to come after, right? So now we are trying to incentivize them. So it's the other way around. We increase the alpha, and but at some point we'll have to decrease it because I believe we'll have too much overinvestment because of that and the great congestion problems, etc., that we have not uh, taken into account here. I think there are other questions. All right. Thanks for your question, Dimitrios. Yeah, right. we can uh, let uh, Zachary de Grieve. Uh, ask his question next. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your nice presentation. We triggered a lot of questions. I will only ask one, and maybe more related to the first part. Um, you studied a setup of a particular community where you know community members are in a single building and are sharing a, a single meter. And I am wondering if your results could generalize easily to another setup where I think that you showed on one of your slides, in fact. But uh, on a setup where you know you have different households in a neighborhood, in a, in a district, for instance, which have their own meter and which uh, which have their, who have their own uh, contract with a supplier for buying uh, energy, which is not uh, self-consumed uh, locally. And I'm wondering if to what extent your your results can generalize in such to such a situation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for the question. I. <clears throat> If you keep the meter, uh, then you might decrease uh, per household to per house, then you might decrease the aggregation benefits. So for overall, I would say that the value might be a little bit decreased, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, and in that case, what happens is that usually the core of the game is a little bit um, smaller. So it's, it's the size, you know, you, have, you can define using a matrix, the size of the core. So I would say that to make these communities stable would require additional constraints on the profiles. Uh, but I, I I take this cautiously because I don't want to give you the impression. Sir, but I have we have to simulate. It's it's definitely something that we um, are interested in um, to generalize that. So m my first intuition is that there is you know the value will be there positive there is some good chance that the core is not empty but smaller which means that maybe the shopping won't be there okay thank you all right and maybe Anthony, if you have a quick question you can go ahead also sure thanks Ibrahim. very interesting stuff um quick question i was motivated by a recent paper i came across uh are, are you assuming that the pv capacity is uh, a variable or is something exogenous to the problem 
Well, it is in the general formulation of the problem, it is a variable, it is a decision variable. But in the paper, um, to derive some theoretical results, um, we had to have some assumptions on the um, convexity of the cost function, which means that at some point we knew that we were going to hit the bound, which means that it became exogenous at some point. And then we can derive results on cooperative games. But for all the numerical simulations that we have, it's optimized. I see, uh, but, but uh, from an in terms of designing the allocation rule, does it matter if it's being decided? The reason I'm asking this to get to the point is the following. Um, there was a discussion about whether it's worth building, uh, you know, for, 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 for a bunch of households to, to, to agree to invest in solar or not. And one interesting thing I discovered, and I checked this with Solar City and Sunrun and a bunch of other companies in California, is they don't uh, they don't build on buildings. They only build in single family households. And I think the reason is they don't want to bother with all of this, all of the negotiations, and um, possibly also the value per building is is relatively uh, small in terms of uh, compared to the bureaucracy of dealing with a multi party uh, entity. So th that's a bit the reason. If your allocation rule depends on the assumption that the thing that you're building has to be agreed upon, but if there is no market for building for a community, I, I wonder what your reaction to that would be. Yeah, thank you for this uh, point. Very interesting. So maybe, so so we tried in in a lot of simulations, and actually the one that I showed you at the at the end to take into account um, what you say, and it's what we call the coordination costs, right? So the fact that the bigger the community, the you know a lot of problems you're going to have, um, even administrative stuff, and it's going to be costly. And what we see is that indeed. <laughs> Um, it, 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 this is why you have no non-trivial energy communities at the equilibrium. Is at the end you might end up with uh, one prosumer and two households, and then four households at the end, right? So just to say that we are aware of that problem, and it kind of you know as a proxy could be taken into account in in our uh, in our uh, in our setting. Now to go back to your first point, um, indeed. So I don't think and I totally agree with you that the results on the validity of the allocation rule is going to depend on the decision variable. So the decision variable might influence the value that you're going to generate. I agree, but the way you're going to allocate it is mainly dependent, I would say, on more on the profiles and their correlation with time and the grid structure, the grid tariffs, etc more than on the real value. I mean, there is a link, but I, I would say that the general uh, results would apply um, if you if you fix the capacity at some point and, and you don't and you don't uh, invest in it and you don't define it. Yeah, sure. Um, I can I can subscribe to that intuition for sure. Thanks, uh, Ibrahim. Very interesting presentation. Thank you again, Anthony and Ilias and, and, and all yeah. for, for the questions. Thanks, Anthony. I will uh then start sharing my screen since I'm the next one to uh, to present. Uh, oh yeah, one sec. Sorry. Um, okay. So maybe I need to do that first. So, can you all see my screen now? Yes. Cool. All right. So, yeah, as I said, I'll present some of the work I did with uh, Anthony on models and algorithm for clearing integrated TND markets. So, with ACOPF and on convex offers. So, as you may all know, uh, the electricity systems are changing and they are not considered as binary anymore. Indeed, before we had uh, the transmission network mainly producing power that was consumed in the distribution network. But now with the integration of uh, distribution uh, so with the integration of renewable energy sources, 
mainly in the distribution systems. Uh, we have to rethink uh, the way uh, the electricity, electricity markets are organized. And some of the ideas we need to, to think of when reorganizing the electricity markets are typically the fact that now uh, distribution systems must be integrated in the uh, market clearing decision process. Uh, that the DSOs, that is the um, operator of the distribution system, will have a more, more active role. And also that uh, some of the assumptions that are made in the transmission network are not valid for the distribution systems. And in particular, uh, distribution systems uh, are more complex to model uh, in that aspect. And we can see a lot of uh, projects going on uh, concerning flexibility or TND coordination uh, within Europe. So uh, NRA, GOPAX or Nodes, for example, also Soteria in Belgium and other European uh, Commission projects such, such as SmartNet, Coordinates or Hedgeflex. And in fact, uh, this work is also part of the FEVER project. So it's a, a Horizon 2020 project uh, financing uh, the last month of my PhD. It's gathering 17 partners. It started this year and it will end in 2023. Uh, our main collaborator in the project is Henex, uh, so who is the Hellenic Power Exchange. And the role of UC Louvain in that project is to define the relevant market mechanism and to implement the real-time market platform, market clearing platform, uh, which is the main topic of, of this presentation. And uh, some of the challenges that we have to face when uh, uh, taking into account both transmission and distribution are the following. So as I said, uh, some of the assumptions that are valid for the transmission network are not uh, for are not valid for the distribution network, and it special and it especially relates to the physical representation of them. Uh, we have to take into account uh, losses, voltage constraints, and reactive power when we model a distribution network. Another aspect relates with the scale of uh, TND networks. Um, so in this paper of Karamanis, they are clearly mentioned that. Uh, the number of transmission buses uh, is of thousands, while uh, distribution networks are more gathering uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes. So this changes um, a lot the scale of the problem that you have to solve. Uh, also, uh, and it has already been discussed uh, during today's presentations, we have to take to think of uh, privacy and decentralization. Uh, the TSO is in charge of the transmission network, the GSOs are in charge of the, the distribution networks, So, and even if they want to cooperate, there is still some privacy on each of the network to preserve. And finally, one last point that is interesting in, uh, in this talk is the fact that we need to ensure uh, that prices are coherent and make, par make participants want to stay in the market. And having um, non-convex physics in the network, but also non-convex stru structure in the bid that you can insert, compl complicates how you draw prices in that context. So I just gave a bit of context about the work. I will present how we model the real-time market clearing problem uh, that we need to solve. Uh, I will present, focus mainly on the residual supply function approach that is our uh, decentralized approach that we developed. I will show some preliminary uh, numerical uh, illustration and I will provide some conclusions. Uh, on the I hear somebody. Uh, if you can please mute your, your mic. Uh, yes, so I will uh, go ahead. Concerning the assumptions we, we make in this work, so as I said, we have a TND network and we are looking at real-time markets. Uh, by real-time markets, we are thinking of uh, balancing markets, which is activating transmission or distribution reserves in order to uh, adjust the predetermined dispatch. Uh, we will consider a time horizon of um, an hour, but we have to take the decisions for the next 15 minutes. 
Uh, these time steps are discretized, yeah, as I said, three or four time steps for an hour, and we need to take the decision for the next 15 minutes. Uh, concerning the network, we will assume that uh, the transmission network is meshed and that we can apply the DC approximation of the power flow equations and that the, rate, uh, the, transmission, the distribution network is radial, but we will need the true AC power flow equations uh, in that network. And this is uh, kind of in line with what uh, Leonardo um, talked about this morning. We will also assume that there is only one line connecting uh, the transmission network to the distribution system. And on that figure, even if I only if I'm only showing a transmission network connected to one distribution network, uh, the, the results I will show can uh, generalize to one transmission network connected to several uh, distribution network. And in that integrated TNG market, uh, we have the following uh, actors. So we have the TSO and the GSO. I already talked about them. They have kind of the, the role you might expect. We will also assume that at, at each bus of the network, we have mites, prosumers, or balancing service providers, uh, as we call BSP. And they can be seen as the flexibility providers. Uh, at each location, we, are, we might also have a BRP, uh, and you can see them as a price in elastic loads. And we will add uh, a service called uh, aggregation disaggregation service. This service will ideally be handled by the GSO, but this is not in line with uh, what you might expect from a GSO currently. So we keep this service as uh, an extra um, agent but and it can be handled either by the GSO or another party and the, the role of this uh, service would be to aggregate the distribution uh, BSP offer at the TNG interface while ensuring a good representation of the of the distribution network and we will do that by using the residual supply functions and also when disaggregating the offer uh, accepted, this AGS uh, will have to coordinate with the GSO to make sure that the dispatch are feasible. All right, so to summarize what we want uh, in this work, uh, we want to implement a practical clearing uh, platform, platform capable of ensuring several stuff. The first one being that you want uh, decisions that are near optimal, you want your um, dispatch to be feasible in order not to violate uh, any constraints on the network, but you also want your uh, prices to be uh, coherent and consistent for all the actors. So LMPs uh, uh, stands for uh, locational marginal prices. Since we are in the real time uh, context, we want our problem to be solved quickly, so we need to respect a certain time frame. And also, ideally, we want uh, this platform to ensure that the privacy of each operators and generators or, or loads is met. And the basic problem you need to solve uh, when uh, uh, implementing this platform is AC optimal power flow. So I, I think more of you, uh, most of you are familiar with this problem. We have a network uh, connected, connected with several lines where you can have uh, generators and certain loads. Uh, so throughout the whole presentation, the set of buses would be B, the set of lines L, the set of generators uh, J. And the classical variable you have in this problem are P and Q, the real and reactive power injection uh, at each generator. You have the power flow, the flow, the real and reactive power flow FP and FQ, and you have the uh, voltage magnitude and angle V and theta. And when you uh, write down your power flow equations, you get the following, but first maybe I will go quickly through the uh, different quantities you have. So you have the dispatch instructions P and Q, as I said. You have the operational decisions uh, F, P, FQ, V and theta. You have the fixed load that are determined by the BRPs uh, at each location, so either real or reactive, and this is a parameter. You have also the network properties. 
So typically, uh, G is the conductance, B is the susceptance, and this relates with the properties of the lines. And what you're trying to do in this problem, so as I said, is trying to minimize the generation costs. You need to satisfy, so these constraints are the power balance constraints. We will aggregate them through uh, using this F function, Fi of X equals zero for each bus. Typically, the prices you assign to electricity are defined using uh, LMPs, so and they can be seen as dual variables of uh, these two constraints. And the last two constraints are the real and reactive flow definitions. And you can see the non-convexities of this problem, which is indeed hard to solve because you have quadratic terms here, a product of two voltages here, and sign on a difference of angle. You also have other type of constraints related to uh, engineering uh, limits. So you want your voltage to be within certain bounds. You want your flow to be between certain bounds also. And this, al along with um, flow definition, relates to operational constraints. So we will uh, use this set to define them. And you kind of have the same um, con gener uh, generation constraints on your P and Q variable, and we aggregate, in, aggregate them uh, using the generation uh, constraints. All right, uh, now that we define the, the AC power flow, I said that in the transmission, you can use the DC approximation. And to understand how the DC approximation works, we go back to our uh, basis uh, constraints of OPF. And uh, what you want is a linear version of the problem, linearized version of the problem. And to uh, get this, we will first get rid of reactive power. We will assume that it's not uh, of importance when considering a large network such as transmission. And we will consider that the uh, conductance is zero. So you might get rid of the terms having uh, G. And the other assumption is that your voltages will be close to one and your difference angles are small, so you can get rid of the sign. And after all, if you uh, apply all of the assumptions, you end up with a linear problem. So your real power balance becomes linear, but also your uh, real power flow definition becomes linear. All right, so now we can start to write down the integrated TNG real-time market clearing problem. As I said, we are minimizing generation costs for all the whole network, subject to the transmission constraints. So transmission constraints, we start with the uh, power flow constraints uh, at each transmission bus. Uh, the fact that the operational uh, decisions are in a certain set of constraints, same for the generation. And we have uh, the distribution uh, network satisfying the AC equations. So we have again the power balance constraints, the operational decision within a certain set, and the same for the generation. All right, so now we have written the problem on the transmission network, on the distribution network. We have to link them. So we use uh, this uh, Z variable, which is in fact just the flow between. Uh, the transmission and the distribution, but we will just write it down as Z. And for ease of modeling, uh, we will assume that this Z variable is duplicated in the transmission and in the distribution. All right, but what we want is also, as I said, is also to take into account a complex bit structure. And to do so, we will introduce uh, one or several variables YJ which are binaries in order to, comp to model complex bit structure. And in fact, this uh, binary variable will affect the injection PG, and but also QG, in fact, so I forgot to add also QG for the distribution uh, network. And why do we need binary variables to model that? Because you might think of uh, power injection being uh, modeled as a block bit, or also you can have bits arriving as uh, exclusive bits. So for example, one generator can decide 
to put five bids in the net in the market, but with the constraint that you only uh, can accept one. And to model that in, in our problem, it only affects the generation decisions. So what we say is that we add this uh, binary variable yj in the in the process and it uh, changes also the set of generation constraints on both transmission and uh, distribution side. All right, uh, another aspect of of the problem to take into account is the fact that uh, we want this to be solved on a time horizon of one hour, so we have a multi-period uh, OPF at the end. So we're trying to minimize the generation costs on all generators and for every time steps. Uh, then the, we will assume that the um, intertemporality uh, is only on the generation. So which means that we want our power balance constraint to be satisfied for every time step, and we want our operational constraints to be satisfied for every time step. Uh, and as I said, the time coupling will only appear on the generation decisions, and you can think of, uh, of RUM constraints or minimum duration of a bid activation as being uh, intertemporal. Uh, for the, or also you can think of a storage, but if you want to think of a minimum duration of a bid activation, you can think of, uh, okay, I want or something like this. Right. Uh, then. Um, you get a formulation of the complete integrated TND real-time market uh, problem, uh, which is the following. So you're trying to minimize your generation costs. You have your uh, transmission uh, power balance constraints. I also aggregated the, the generation and operational constraints as only one set. Uh, the same for the distribution, and we also have the interconnection constraints. Uh, this whole problem leads to a, a large-scale non-convex non-convex mixed integer problem, and uh, in which we have to def to to determine uh, not only the primal uh, decisions so xt and xd, but also uh, and so part of the primal decisions or also, also the activation decisions why uh, on transmission generation and distribution generation. But we also need to um, to define the locational marginal prices uh, lambda t and lambda d. So sorry, I can hear again somebody. If it's possible to mute, please. Uh, yeah, let me do that. Fine. All right. Um, so as I said, uh, now we have a large scale non-convex mixed integer problem, so quite hard to, to solve, where in addition we need to define the prices. Uh, so the first question to ask is obviously how to solve this problem. Um, and in fact, you can aggregate all of the uh, non-convexities in um, these constraints, which relates to uh, distribution uh, uh, the, which relates to the distribution system. And in fact, ACOPF has been largely studied, and um, we know that the second order cone relaxation is known to be pretty effective on radial networks. And we will use it for, um, for our uh, platform. And, in, and when using the SOC relaxation, we will use this tilde notation for the set of uh, distribution constraints. So we came up with two centralized approach, which are pretty simple to understand. The first one will be the relaxation approach, where instead of solving the mixed integer nonlinear problem, we will solve the MISOCP version, where we will deduce the Y variables, then fix the Y and solve the resulting SOC in order to deduce X and lambda. 
this uh, approach is uh, can be solved using a commercial solver, but uh, will not ensure a feasibility of the dispatch. And so we'll consider some kind of benchmark where we add this th third step, uh, where we want to recover a feasible dispatch when uh, the distribution decisions are not feasible. But keep, keep in mind that these two approaches uh, do not guarantee the privacy pres preservation because you will have one operator uh, handling the whole network and that would typically be the TSO in charge. And this is not a property that is uh, wanted in, on the market. And to uh, introduce our approach, I will um, use this small example. So I will present the decentralized approach now. So imagine that you have uh, this small network, so one transmission node and two di distribution nodes. You have a generator at each node with different uh, marginal costs. And you want to satisfy this transmission imbalance. So obviously your distribution um, uh, BSPs will be cheaper and you want to use them in order to, to satisfy this demand. And also you have a line limit on the this line connecting BSP two and three. And when uh, you will solve this problem decentrally, you want to aggregate uh, the, the distribution network in one node. And uh, this aggregation should be done carefully and it should be um, um, uh, done using this, um, this residual supply function. What is this residual supply function? It's in a way the aggregated information of the distribution network. So in this, you will see that you will see that you can you might have 0.5 megawatts coming from this distribution network, then one megawatts coming from this distribution network at a 15 euro per megawatt hour cost, and then only the transmission uh, asset would cover for the imbalance. And this trick uh, is the one we will use uh, when developing our framework. So how to do that uh, in practice? So the first step is to build this uh, residual supply function. And what we will do is that we will consider different uh, flow levels uh, at the interface and compute uh, a price in order to be able to uh, build this uh, function, uh, a discretized version of this function. Uh, so for that, you need to solve a distribution problem. In this distribution problem, you have all of the classical constraints. You just have fixed your interface flow and the, uh, the price you want to associate uh, will be the dual uh, value of this constraint. But in this simplified uh, distribution problem, we assume that the, um, that the uh, use the SOCP relaxation and that our binary variable are relaxed. And here we're only interested in prices, so we don't have to, we don't need to have a, a feasible dispatch. And that's why, and that's also something we know, we only need an approximation of the RSF in, in order to get satisfactory results. Once we've built this RSF, what we will do is use it in order to clear the transmission market. So we have the classical transmission constraints, and we add uh, the residual supply function because we aggregated the distribution information at the TNG interface. And we are carefully when putting the we are careful when putting this residual supply function as the Z variable is defined as follow. From this process, we will deduce the um, transmission activation and also the transmission uh, dispatch. But also we will fix uh, from now on the interface flow and we have a price associated with this uh, interface flow. All right, and um, once we've solved that, we need to disaggregate, so need to find a dispatch for uh, the distribution system and we will solve the actual uh, distribution problem uh, using uh, the um, fixing the interface flow. So we first solve this problem using the SOCP version in order to get the Y variables and then use the same problem with the true AC um, 
uh, equations and get the dispatch uh, variables. All right, and then we have, you need to do one more step in order to deduce uh, prices for transmission and distribution. And to do so, we will, um, we will uh, not fix the interface flow anymore and solve one transmission problem and one distribution problem in order to deduce uh, lambda t and lambda d. And this might not be tri trivial to understand, so I will just use uh, the example to explain why we did this uh, last step. So the optimal solution for this example, as I said, is producing zero at uh, generation one, 0 0.5 at generation two, and 0 0.5 at generation uh, generator three. And uh, the clearing prices are 15, 15, and 10. And the question is how you can recover uh, the, the clearing prices. So it, by doing that in a decentralized fashion. So assume that we have uh, cleared the interface flow and we know that it's minus one. The transmission problem is then minimize the transmission costs. We have the power balance um, at node one and we have the power generation at not one that is uh, between bounds and we have fixed the um, the flow at the interface uh, and this problem needs to the same primal uh, so to the optimal primal decisions and you are left with this system of kkts to solve and in this system you have three equalities but four variables so you have a non-unique dual solution and you might have a non-unique uh, lambda one, which is not a property that you want. And in order to have access to a unique lambda one, what you would do, assume that we have the interface, an interface that was the case. Uh, so if you look quickly, we, has, we had this interface price here. And instead you will solve the problem, uh, this problem here of minimizing transmission uh, cost with a penalization on the interface flow and without fixing it. And this small trick of solving an extra uh, optimization problem will um, replace this KKT by the following, where we indeed uh, end up with lambda 1 equals 15. So this was a brief example to try and explain what we did. Um, and uh, this gives you the whole picture of, on the uh, RSF approach. Before moving to the uh, numerical illustration, I just wanted to say a quick word on how to assess a solution X, Y, Lambda that we get from uh, the real-time uh, market clearing problem. So it's quite easy to, to compare the primal decisions because you, you could think of comparing the objective values. So, uh, but you kind of need to also to evaluate the consistency of your prices. And to do so, we will use uh, the production costs defined as follow, but also we will use the lost opportunity costs. And the lost opportunity cost can be seen as a measure of, uh, of how much it costs to incentivize a player to stay in the market. And to explain that, maybe uh, we will see what the BSP would do uh, with its generator. So a generator will typically try to maximize uh, its profits, and this is how we define your profit. So you, you need your uh, generator to satisfy your generation constraints, and you want to uh, maximize the profits, saying that you want the, the price that is clear, you want the quantity, you want to, to maximize your, your profit. And in fact, if the BSP can uh, can uh, gain more by deviating from the dispatch P and Q that is uh, imposed by the market operator, then it will induce a cost for him. And this is how we define uh, the lost opportunity cost. Uh, for uh, people who are familiar with this, um, with this uh, aspect, uh, it's referred as generator side payments uh, for generator and uh, potential congestion revenue shortfall for network operator in uh, Garcia's paper. 
So I'm a bit over time, so I'm gonna go quickly. So we quick so we tested the the um, the approach on Italian test cases provided by SmartNet. So the first test case is a small one, a medium sized one, and the two other test cases are pretty large uh, networks with a, a large number of bits. And here is uh, the, the the results we get. So I. I reported the, the three approaches we came up with. So the two centralized and the RSF. Here we have 100 points on the uh, residual supply function. I reported the solve time, the objective func value, uh, the percentage of production cost. So this is how far uh, in terms of production cost we are to the relaxation. Uh, percentage on, on the LOC is how much uh, the LOC represents uh, compared to the production cost and also the maximum violation of certain constraints because I, rem I need to remind that the relaxation can provide um, non-feasible uh, dispatches. And so for this small example, as I said, we have satisfying results uh, concerning the RSF. It's pretty close to what you can expect uh what you can expect from uh, centralized approaches uh, for the first uh, large test case uh we also get an object we get an objective function that is a bit uh a bit far from from optimal but in terms of production cost and loc it stays uh, uh relatively reasonable and also you might see that here the relaxation did not provide a feasible dispatch. And we kind of have uh, the same um, results for the for the largest uh, test case. And a quick word on on the solve time. So something I did not mention, but the, the RSF approach is highly. Um, we can highly parallelize this approach and this between parentheses is kind of a um, ideal uh, parallelized uh, solve time and I also reported uh, the execution time if we had a more realistic number of, uh, of processors and you can see that this problem can be solved within a minute for a quite large test case if you have 30 to 64 uh, processors. All right, so a quick conclusion before we switch to the Q&A. So we, we saw that we have developed and implemented uh, a decentralized approach that is uh, capable of attacking the the market, the real-time market clearing uh, problem. And uh, even if the results are prelim preliminary, uh, they are still uh, very promising. And future directions of the work will involve uh, so first elaborating on the on the results, then try alternative methods for uh, pricing because for the moment it's mainly relying on the pricing from uh, O'Neill. Also, we have other test cases, uh, test systems like in Denmark, so we want to test it on, on the Danish test case. And also all of this um, uh, work uh, is kind of uh, an ideal uh, way of, of thinking of uh, European uh, balancing markets and need to be uh, we need to elaborate a bit on how it will in indeed be applied in an European context. So thank you for listening and I will have, be happy to, to take your questions. So thanks, Ilyas. So we have around uh, 10 minutes for questions. So if you yeah, have any questions. Sorry, I, I went a bit over time. Maybe I can take the opportunity to clarify um, a question that came up offline regarding the exclusive bids. Um, if, if I understand correctly, the platform is supposed to accommodate both minimum up or down time of uh, type of constraints, Ilias. So yes. if I'm not mistaken, some assets can offer mean up down times like you have in usual unit commitment problems but uh, there's also exclusive products is, is that right exclusive yes. offers yeah okay yeah, yeah. just just for sake of clarification because the exclusive offers are more of an um, I, I mean I, I i haven't seen this product definition beyond the eu they had markets 
the ideas you, you take, instead of implicitly describing the set of feasible trajectories of an asset through parameters like min up and down times and p max, p min, for example, you approximate this um, uh, essentially infinite set of possible trajectories with a um, discrete set of possible trajectories. Each of them is offered as a take it or leave it product at a certain uh, price to the platform and the exclusive, uh, mutually exclusive requirements as you can only pick one of these possible trajectories uh, as, as the, uh, the one for using this specific asset. So I'm not sure um, if, if that helps uh, uh, clarify the question that came up, but if not, uh, feel free to jump in and, and pose the question. So if there is no question, maybe I can start with one. Um, so I have a question about I, your... I uh, see Alan Mariana has raised this and I suspect I know what to ask. Yes, I have uh, one question. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. And, and do you think it's possible to, to adopt such an approach for uh, you provided some example, but for real case uh, issue where you have a huge uh, size of uh, distribution system combined with the transmission system, do you, do you believe it's, it's a practical way to to optimize at the same time uh, in a centralized way the, those uh, uh, those price? You mean in a centralized or decentralized way? I don't, I, I, the, the way you are doing it. Okay, yeah, I. it's true that we are um, maybe doing a lot of assumptions that are not currently uh, current practice in Europe, but um, as I said, using a lot of, uh, if you have access to a lot of computational uh, F, computational efforts and uh, and you can let's say handle that then it might be implementable in practice and in fact what we know if, if I can maybe explain uh, what was uh, the motivate motivation behind this work is that when we received uh, this um, this data uh, within the scope of the smartnet project, uh, the, the first comment was, we are solving this, uh, trying to solve this problem using SOC relaxations and our uh, execution time were extremely high and we don't know how to to make the, the computation more efficient. And by implementing these ideas of, of decentralization, we managed to, to, to drastically uh, decrease the solve time. So I think there is room for such uh, practice, but it's true that f at the moment uh, the uh, European uh, energy markets are not modeled the, the way we, we did it at, at the moment, at least. And, and in, in the table you provided, uh, times are provided in, in second. In seconds, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I yeah. didn't have the time to elaborate on that. But yeah, there are in seconds. So I reported that the, the solve time. If you solve it, maybe this one is more interesting. If you solve it uh, centrally, let's say. So this started to be starting to be important. And this is also if you solve it sequentially. And this is an ideal uh, parallelized solve time that you can still be within a minute. Uh, with quite of a uh, a good computing, uh, I guess. If I can add one, one remark on that, the, the features of um, 
market clearing that, that make it especially difficult have to do with complex pricing requirements. Here, the whole trick of the residual supply function is that it translates everything that's happening under the feeder to simple bids, essentially. So if we can expect that whatever platform is in place currently can handle a bunch, a lot uh, more simple bids, um, those are continuous variables and, and what you try and achieve is get approximately right the amount of power that you're flowing on the interface and once that's achieved in the central platform then the disaggregation part can cope with a much smaller uh, distribution subproblem. There are many of these but they're each individually much smaller and independent of, of each other. So that's a uh, kind of how we envision coping to some extent with the scale of the problem. Okay, so other questions? Apparently not. So me, I have one. It's um, when you show your second test case, so it's an intermediate size between the the two uh, the two others. And how do you? I mean, what's your intuition of why it's working? It seems to work very well for the first and the third one, and a bit less good on the on the medium one. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, sorry, I struggled to unmute, but now I can talk. Uh, so yes, you, you you mean in terms of objective value, right? Yeah, in or, terms of objective. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what's happening is that it kind of uh, has to do with the way uh, you discretize uh, your residual supply function. So it's true that so first thing is that I change. So I have a uh, hundred extra points for the last. Uh, test case because it was even bigger than this one. But yeah, you can refine uh, the objective value that you get if you add obviously points, but this is kind of a, you need to find a good uh, mix between uh, computational effort and objective value. And uh, this particular, um, we, we had this bad objective value, I mean, in a way, because there was some kind of a tr trick, a tricky thing happening in the transmission network in that test case where if you were not optimal, you end up accepting an offer that is uh, way, um, way more expensive than the marginal one you accepted before. And that's why it's kind of difficult to control the, um, uh, the this effect on the objective value, but you can I can easily answer this one saying, yeah, you just we just need to add more more points on, on the residual supply function that we compute. Okay, thanks. So maybe there is time for if not, we can stop here and we have a five minute break before resuming. Yes, we will have this uh, a five minute break and we will be back in five minutes with Borax talk.
So we're back after a break. Uh, Burak, I think you can uh, unmute and put the camera. Hi. I hope Hi. you're doing fine. Uh, so I'll let you share your screen while I introduce you. So Burak Kuchuk is an assistant professor at the Industrial Engineering Program at Sabanchi University. He, was, he obtained his bachelor and master's in math and industrial engineering uh, from Mogadishu University. He obtained his PhD degree in operation research at Georgia Tech. And before joining Savanchi University, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Tepper School of Business. And his current research uh, focuses on mixed integer nonlinear programming and stochastic optimization from both theoretical and methodological aspects. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you the floor now. Uh, uh, Burak, thanks for uh, participating in, in this uh, mm -hmm. session. Of course, uh, thanks a lot Elias for the introduction. So I hope you can hear me well and you can see my uh, screen. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so before I start, I would like to also thank uh, Anthony for the invitation and I would like to congr congratulate all the uh, PhD students who graduated or about to graduate. And uh, today I'd like to talk uh, a recent work uh, we are about to complete on an analysis of the multi-period optimum power flow problem with electric vehicles under emission considerations. So this is a joint work with my former master student, uh, Ece Kayacik. Ece is now a PhD student at the University of Groningen and uh, our collaborator was to Che Yuxai. She is a faculty member at Sabanj University, Mechatronics and Energy Groups. Okay, so here is the outline uh, for today. Um, I'd like to give a very brief introduction to optimum power flow problem and signal order comp programming. Uh, this will serve as a basis for the remaining of the talk, which will be our focus today. Uh, so multi-period optimum power flow problem with electric vehicles. And I, I'm planning to spend more time on the application and uh, I'll talk about the problem definition and the formulation and all the details uh, about the work. And so let me go to the optimum power flow problem first. So thanks to Ilias, uh, I don't have to go over everything one by one. In any case, I'm assuming that the attendees of this uh, workshop are already familiar with the concepts. But I just still want to spend a few minutes uh, so that uh, I can introduce the notation, uh, which will make it easier for the rest of the talk to follow. So optimum power flow problem uh, aims to supply electricity to satisfy the demand uh, in a power network. And uh, typically we can think about the objective function as a minimization of generation cost. All the other objectives uh, can, can exist, for instance, uh, power loss, uh, min loss minimization, or as we will see in this slide, uh, perhaps emission minimization. And optimum power flow is uh, sort of a complex optimization problem. Uh, let's say it has uh, many different aspects. So some of these aspects come from the physical nature of electricity. Uh, so for instance, power balance and power flow equations, uh, but also there are engineering requirements like network operating limits, stability conditions, and uh, constraints of that sort. So here is a illustration of a power uh, network. Uh, so we have the buses, generators, transmission lines, loads, uh, all the components are presented here. And here are the parameters uh, I would like to now uh, define. So for each generator, we have the output limits. Uh, for each bus, we have the load and the voltage limits and shunts uh, components. And for transmission lines, we have, uh, again, this uh, transmission line limits and admittance characteristics. So this is the basic data or the parameters of the problem. And uh, in this problem, uh, we need to define decision variables for generators, buses, and lines. In particular, we need to keep track of the output of generators, uh, both in terms of active and reactive outputs. And at the bus level, we need to know the complex voltage. And at the line level, we need to keep track of the flow variables. 
OK, with this notation, uh, we can present the polar formulation uh, of the optimum power flow, flow problem as follows. Uh, by the way, uh, to make it easier to follow, uh, you can think of the red or brownish symbols as the parameters of the problem and black symbols as the decision variables. Um, so here we have an objective function H, uh, and as I mentioned before, this can be typically a cost, but it can be something else uh, as well. Uh, we have different types of constraints. Uh, so we have the power balance, power flow constraints, very similar to Elias's uh, presentation. Uh, we have the voltage limits, and then uh, we have the operational uh, limits as well. And uh, typically, what uh, if you are familiar with some of my recent work, we uh, generally try to use an alternative formulation, which seems easier to convexify and do other uh, more advanced stuff. So let me also very briefly explain uh, the alternative formulation of the OPF problem. So the idea is quite simple, actually, and uh, it has been used before us uh, too. So uh, let me go back. Uh, so these constraints look, uh, let's say, complicated because of the nonlinear relation between the variables. But you can see that all the nonlinearity is uh, are either of the form this vi square or vi vj cosine vi vj sine. So the idea is to define new variables for each of these nonlinear, non-convex components and try to linearize uh, many of the constraints. Uh, now, as you can see, power balance and power flow are linear now, in addition to vol voltage limits. Uh, but of course, there's a price you have to pay. Uh, if you linearize some certain constraints, some uh, other constraints become nonlinear, or you need to add some consistency constraints. Uh, so, so that's why we need to add these consistency constraints, which uh, again keep the problem non-convex as it should be. Um, now, there are of course challenges to solve large-scale uh, OPF instances, and theoretically uh, we know that the OPF problem is NP-hard, um, but in practice uh, actually people have been able to solve large uh, OPF instances to global or almost global optimality. Um, but the challenge in typically is the following. Uh, many, for many cases, local solvers are quite successful, but they do not guarantee any optimality. They do not provide any global optimality. On the other hand, convex drag stations are useful because they can prove global optimality, but typically they are not exact. Uh, so, that is why this is one of the challenges in the OPF literature. In some sense, it, the problem is easy because you can find optimal solutions using local solvers. But on the other hand, it is difficult because you cannot certify they are uh, globally optimal. So this is one. Of, this is the main challenge in the OPF uh, problem. And uh, I would like to advocate the use of uh, single order comp programming. Um, so that's why I want to spend maybe a few minutes on this uh, topic, with a general, very brief introduction to single order comp programming. And uh, in this direction, let me first uh, denote the Euclidean norm with the standard uh, notation. And then we uh, define the second order con as the epigraph of the Euclidean norm. And at this point, uh, let me show you a few pictures. Uh, so this is how the cone looks like in uh, in three-dimensional uh, space. And um, using this idea of uh, second-order cone, uh, we can define a second-order cone programming problem. So this problem has a linear objective and second-order conic inequalities. And although uh, your exact problem may not have the same structure. Uh, if it is second order con representable, uh, this means that there exists some representation uh, which can be written in this form. <coughs> uh, excuse me. And the nice feature of second order con programming, similar to other, uh, other certain types of conic programming, 
is that it can be solved in polynomial time with entry point methods. And uh, there is a chance that they can be also useful for the OPF problem. And because of the following uh, realization, uh, the one of the main reasons we switch to the alternative formulation uh, is that it's very easy to obtain the SOCP relaxation. Uh, what you only need to do is uh, change the sign of the equality here to less than or equal to and forget about the other consistency. Uh, constraint. So this is an SOCP and uh, in practice you can solve really large instances of the OPF problem this way uh, and obtain a relaxation. Now, after this brief introduction to optimum power flow and second order comp programming, now let me talk a little, uh, let me talk more in more detail about the multi-period OPF problem with uh, EVs. Um, so uh, I guess one of the main reasons we, we were interested in this problem uh, was the introduction of EVs and their penetration to the market. And uh, we all know that the number of EVs are increasing uh, in uh, Europe and uh, US, North America in particular. And one of the reasons is uh, it is more affordable to uh, purchase EVs and also governments uh, give incentives. And I, I believe this is a figure from um, uh, Europe data. Uh, in 20 years, it is expected that the EVs, uh, there will be more EVs than conventional vehicles. Okay, uh, so this seems promising in terms of, uh, let's say, more environmentally friendly way of transportation. But there is also another aspect which uh, one needs to consider. The effect of uh, this added demand or load to the power grid. Because just to be able to charge these electric vehicles, you need more electricity, uh, obviously. And uh, for this purpose, you can either use the current power plants, which might be coal filled or uh, let's say, which may not be very environmentally friendly, or you may try to use more renewable energy resources. Uh, but then um, to under, really understand the effect to the power grid, you also need to know a little bit about how people uh, use their EVs uh, for instance, what are their driving profiles, what are their uh, EV charging profiles, uh, etc. In the future, I think it, this was also mentioned in one of the previous talks, in the future people will be able to sell uh, their electricity to grids and therefore they can use their uh, electric vehicles as batteries and then feed back into the grid. Uh, so this is uh, vehicle to grid technology. Uh, so there's also this aspect. Uh, therefore, you have to think a little bit about all these components to make a fair analysis of what could happen if there are certain number of uh, conventional vehicles now becoming uh, electrified. And uh, so this is the main motivation about uh, about this work. And uh, to to make a, a reasonable analysis, uh, we first an optimization problem, but I guess the more uh, we focused in this work is how we can obtain in a reasonable way the parameters of this optimization problem. Because uh, as you might imagine, there are many aspects. Uh, you need to know the grid, you need to know the EV information, you need to know the emission requirements, uh, emission marginal emission factors, etc. So there are many uh, data sets that you need to consider. Um, so I believe this is one of our uh, contributions under some certain assumptions. We try to combine different data sets uh, into a single uh, optimization problem. In terms of uh, optimization, there's uh, not much difference from, from a classical sort of OPF problem. And using second order con uh, programming idea, uh, we were able to find uh, almost globally optimal uh, solutions, uh, probably. 
And uh, our computational results also show that uh, the marginal emissions can be significantly reduced by even if we uh, keep almost the cost constant because there are now two conflicting objectives. And we could agree it might be a good idea under some uh, certain cases. Now, this is just a summary of what I would like to discuss. And in the remaining time I have, let me go into the details. Um, first of all, I want to show you the formulation uh, we have come up with. So I don't want to bombard you with a lot of notation. Uh, so I think the, after the next three slides or so, uh, we will be done with this uh, notation. So please uh, bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, so the major difference in the multi-period uh, case is that, of course, we need to add this time index to all the variables and most of the parameters. And in addition to model the EV aspect, uh, we now need to uh, know when we charge these vehicles and when we discharge them. Also, we need to keep track of some stock variable uh, to know how much electricity is stored in, uh, in, uh, at a bus or at a, uh, at a vehicle. Now, uh, once we define these uh, sort of uh, these type of variables, uh, you need to also know some of the parameters like upper bounds uh, for this and lower bounds. And uh, but the major information, major difference uh, is the uh, last three uh, parameters. Perhaps I can uh, spend if I can spend some time uh, trying to explain them. Now, since we are also interested in the emission, uh, we need to know if some of the conventional vehicles become electrified, how much more uh, power should be with reference to the current situation. And if we know this, then we can compute the total marginal emission, uh, uh, total additional uh, emission uh, we have, since we assume that we know the marginal emission parameter. Okay, so let me show you the uh, model so that I hope this part will become uh, more clear. Uh, again, uh, we can think of H as a cost function typically, but it can be something else. Then we have uh, stock constraints, essentially what you have now plus what you uh, what you charge minus what you discharge should be the next uh, stock level in the next time period. Then we have variable bonds for uh, for the uh, for some of the stock variables and charging discharging variables. And this constraint is quite important, the emission limits. Uh, remember from the previous slide, P tilde was the reference production. So this is what happens if there is no electric vehicle, let's say. And P is the optimal solution, or, or P is the uh, production with the EVs. And the difference is the marginal uh, production, and we multiply this by the marginal uh, emission factor to compute the total marginal emission, and this should be upper bounded by some E bar. And in the analysis, we change E bar, and we try to obtain a part of frontier, essentially, uh, emission versus cost. And the rest of the uh, constraints uh, are coming from the OPF aspect of the problem. So I, I don't want to go into the details of this because I've already uh, summarized uh, these constraints before. Okay. So one of the challenges we faced was, uh, as I mentioned before, to combine all these sources of information uh, that is needed to make a, a reasonable analysis. And for this purpose, we, we uh, we understand that we need to under uh, we need these four data sets, and uh, so the OPF instance, the grid information, the uh, R electricity demand, because OPF instance typically comes with a single period problem. So we also need to know the R electricity demand. So I, we are solving this problem for a day. Uh, therefore, uh, we need to know the load profile. Uh, so we need to know the marginal emission factors and driving profiles. And then uh, even if we have these from different sources, 
there is a pre-processing step which we need to put them together in a reasonable way. Um, so, and uh, we, uh, after, uh, after going through the literature, we uh, noticed that we can find these resource, these informations from four different sources for the US data sets. Therefore, we focused on the computational part to the US grid. And uh, in particular, we look at these three instances from the, uh, from the PGOPF library. But the authors have a disclaimer, so they, they say that these are not the exact systems, but they are realistic enough. Uh, so this is what we understand from their comments. So we have the great data. Uh, but as I said before, OPF instance comes with a single period uh, demand data. So to know the load variations in a certain day, we looked at Energy Information Administration's website. Uh, we downloaded the R, the early uh, grid data from uh, from these uh, states, and then we normalized everything with respect to the largest uh, demand, and uh, we profiles. And we use these factors in the multi-period OPF problem to decide the uh, conventional loads uh, in the system. And the third component is coming from the energy emission uh, factors, and we obtain this data from climate and energy decision making centers. So they have made this analysis and estimated the marginal emission factors, meaning that if you want to produce one more unit of uh, electricity, what is the uh, emission, uh, what is the carbon dioxide emitted uh, with respect to the uh, where you are, es essentially. And the final component is the driving profiles. So this is especially important for us to know when we can charge and discharge the electric vehicles. And uh, as you can see, most of the figures are somehow consistent with respect to the uh, states. So, uh, so that's a good sign that we might be doing something reasonable. And the solution approach is uh, quite uh, simple, actually. Uh, so what we do essentially is to solve the SOCP uh, problem uh, I showed before with, let's say, Groby. And then uh, we look at this solution. We fix the charging and discharging variables in the NLP model. And then we solve the remaining uh, non-convex multi-period OPF uh, with IP -OT. And this gives us an upper bound, SOCP gives us a lower bound, so we know how good we are solving these instances. And finally, we repeat this procedure for different marginal uh, emission uh, limits so that we can obtain a uh, frontier. So we have carried out uh, a lot of uh, experiments. Actually, AJ has carried out these experiments. Uh, but today I don't have time to go over each and every of them, so I will just give you uh, a few slides and try to highlight uh, our observations. And by the way, to make a comparison, we also use the benchmark, a, a very simple one. What happens if, we, if you just start charging your uh, electric vehicle at midnight until it is charged enough for the next day or until it's first trip? Right. Um, so one thing which is clear is that 200 bus instance is quite easy to solve. So we were able to find optimal gaps, which are very small. And uh, for the other instances, which for the sake of time, I will not uh, elaborate more. We were able to also solve them with reasonably small optimal gaps. And uh, one point I would like to make here is uh, about the early load variations. Uh, again, let's look at Illinois 200 bus system and let's look at what happens in winter if we start with zero uh, battery and we only consider grid to vehicle technology. And under cost minimization objective, uh, so the blue curve is the conventional load uh, in the system and the red curve is the demand due to the electric vehicles or the charging of the electric vehicles. Now with cost minimization objective, uh, the um, 
conventional load is very similar to the hourly electricity demand uh, data, which is somehow expected. Uh, and um, if you look at the charging profile, uh, the EVs charge when um, there is less demand in the system and they are not traveling also. But if you minimize emission, so if you choose to minimize emission in the objective, you see a different pattern. And the reason uh, we attribute to the following fact, if you look at all the emission factors, there, there is some variation in the RD emissions and the optimization chooses to chooses to charge these vehicles when the emission factors are relatively small. And when the emission factors are large, it is trying not to charge the vehicles, which, uh, you know, makes sense. So this is one of our observations. The second observation is uh, the effect of vehicle to grid technology. And uh, if you look at the summer with only grid to vehicle technology, you see the uh, here the conventional load uh, due to the demand of the original system. And again, the red is the uh, generation uh, used to charge the electric vehicles. Again, you see a similar pattern to the previous uh, picture. Um, but if you use the vehicle to grid technology in addition, uh, we see something quite interesting. If you look at the evening data, uh, evening uh, information, you see that since the uh, peak load is there in the evening for a summer day, uh, what happens is that the electric vehicles are charged more in the morning and they are used a little bit in the evening so that the curve is flattened here. Okay, so this is more flat than uh, with only grid to vehicle technology. And you can you can make a similar observation for the winter, but not as significant as, as in the summer. And another figure I'd like to show uh, will compare the total cost mm. versus marginal emission with grid to vehicle technology and grid to vehicle plus vehicle to grid technology. And in this figure, you can see the benchmark uh, I mentioned before with this uh, large cross. And this is one of the nice observations we make with a little bit more cost. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this point uh, minimizes the cost, and this point almost gives you the same cost, uh, but you can see that emission is reduced quite significantly, like, like yes, 20 or 25 percent. If you uh, allow to use a little bit more um, electric power generation uh, cost. OK, and uh, with the vehicle to grid technology added, uh, as you can see, this curve is uh, moved downwards. So it is a good sign that vehicle to grid can be quite useful. And if you look at winter, this uh, decrease is even sharper. Therefore, uh, with almost no additional cost, you can reduce the marginal emission um, for free, essentially for free. Uh, by the way, one point I uh, I should also make is that the blue curve here gives you the uh, feasible solutions. So they are really the uh, feasible uh, OPF solutions and the magenta curves are the lower bound curve. Therefore, as you can see, they almost coincide. Therefore, we are uh, pretty we are pretty satisfied with the performance of the even this simple algorithm in this case. And I think this is the last slide I want to show uh, today. Um, so in fact, if you zoom in to some of the figures, you see an uh, interesting behavior uh, as well. Uh, for instance, if you allow grid to vehicle technology in a summer day in Illinois, what happens is that you, you can even uh, reduce the uh, cost. And the reason is that since you can charge your vehicles in uh, earlier in the day and you can use this uh, vehicles as a battery later in the day, let's say in the evening, uh, you can flatten the curve. And essentially this means that there, there will be less losses in the system and uh, you can use this uh, battery as a, uh, you can use your, your EV as a battery and you can reduce the cost 
Of course, there's a trade-off. If you want to reduce costs, you need to emit uh, more carbon dioxide. Uh, but I believe this figure can give some idea to the policymakers about how to incentivize uh, the uh, grid to vehicle technology at the user level. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, in this uh, in this work, we propose a new formulation for the EV uh, for the multi-period OPF with EV and emission concentrations. And we try to combine different data sets in a reasonable way under uh, some certain assumptions, of course. And we believe that our algorithm is uh, successful enough to find uh, globally optimal or almost globally optimal solutions. And uh, I've also mentioned a few of our uh, observations from our computational study. So I believe this is the end of the talk. Uh, so thanks a lot for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Thank you. Thank you, Burak, for your talk. Uh, we can wait maybe a few seconds for the, the audience to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Ibrahim, go ahead if you want. I don't know if you're talking, but you just need to unmute, unmute, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Let me put my camera on. Thank you, thank you a lot for uh, for this presentation and, and this work. I, I have a question. I didn't really understand how you estimate what you call the marginal emission factor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Uh, or, like, is it a function or a constant? Because I see that it is time time dependent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is a data set. We just directly uh, take this data set uh, from from the literature. And uh, as far as I understand, so what they have done is the following analysis. So they look at the current situation in a, uh, let's say, summer day in Illinois at uh, some certain time period. And then uh, they try to estimate what happens if we try to produce, let's say, m one uh, megawatts hour more uh, energy at that time period. And then they look at the marginal generation that would produce this electricity. And then uh, they look at the power plant that generates this electricity, and then uh, they estimate the carbon, additional carbon dioxide that would uh, be incurred. I um, see, but is it yeah. correct to say that this is a marginal argument? Uh, uh, because obviously mm -hmm. if you produce more, then you might you know, call some peakers and increase a lot the emissions. Yeah, of course, this is... Uh, uh, I understand your concern. There should be some upper bound uh, for which this factor is, uh, let's say, uh, reasonable, right? Because after some certain point in time, of course, that generator will not be enough to satisfy the added uh, demand. And then you may have to go to another uh, generator and compute its uh, emission factor. Uh, yeah, you are absolutely right. and. Uh, yeah, we haven't told we haven't thought about that aspect of the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's a nice comment. Uh -huh. Thank you. Right. So I don't see other questions from the audience yet. Maybe I could go with one. So. Um, I was kind of uh, so, so you didn't show any outcomes of the your method of iterating between the SOCP solution and the true AC OPF equations. Can you tell a bit more about that? Or yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, here the algorithm is quite simple. Uh, so it's not even iterative. Uh, 
So uh, essentially what we do is we first solve the SOC relaxation, the, the one uh, I think I showed here, uh, this model. All right. And once we solve this model, uh, we obtain the values of the of, uh, variables. And in particular, uh, we set the A, B and C variables uh, obtained from the SOCP as the correct ones, so to speak. And we made this modification because once A, B and C are fixed, uh, you get rid of all the stock constraints and the problem simplifies to a multi-period OPF instance. And for this purpose, uh, to find feasible solutions uh, after, under this fixation of the AB, AB variables, we go ahead and solve the remaining non-convex problem with IPOT. And that gives us an upper bound and then we compare the lower and upper bounds. So it's as simple as this. Uh, and is it possible that you're, you came up with a, I mean, is it also always possible to obtain an upper bound? Uh, the problem mm -hmm. is always feasible afterwards or? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, so we have not come across with uh, infeasible uh, OPF instances after the fixation of these charging uh, uh, variables. But in general, of course, it might be the case that you fix them to the wrong values and the OPF is infeasible. So it's always possible, but we haven't come across uh, with, this, uh, with such an occurrence in our experiments. And I believe the reason could be the following. Uh, if you look at the, the instance, the, the original instance is feasible, uh, of course. And uh, once we uh, obtain this early electricity demand, we treat the largest, uh, we treat the time period with the largest demand or the peak demand. Uh, is the uh, grid demand coming from the OPF instance. Therefore, the demand is never larger than the highest it can be coming from the OPF. And in addition, the added demand will come from the uh, electric vehicles. And let me show you in this slide that the demand needed to satisfy the charging requirements is small compared to the conventional load already in the system. Therefore, we are modifying the system only a little bit. Uh, so I guess five to six, five to ten percent, depending on the instance. Therefore, since the original instance is feasible, it is very likely that after adding the electric vehicles, the new system is uh, also feasible. Uh, so this is not a proof, but this is just the intuition I have about the experiments. I see. Mm -hmm. I see, and, and then so, and you said you test that for different uh, total emission levels, and then you keep the, your best solution, or, or do you do something else? Ah, uh, okay. So we test it for different emission levels. So the algorithm actually works as follows: in the first step, you solve for, you go for the minimum uh, cost, so you minimize the cost. So that's your objective. And let's look at this figure. This means that uh, once you minimize the cost, uh, you obtain uh, this point. Actually, the magenta, but magenta and blue are almost uh, uh, on top of each other. Uh, so the blue is coming from the IP opt and uh, magenta is coming from the Robbie. And uh, then you generate another point by uh, minimizing the emission. So this magenta point and you fix a B variables, this charging and discharging, to find the blue point. Now that you have these two extreme uh, points, so to speak, uh, you set these E bars, the marginal emission uh, allowance, to different values in between these two points in terms of the emission. And then you go ahead and solve the uh, OPF relaxation uh, restriction uh, in sequence and then generate all the other points in this figure. Okay, right. so this is kind of a Pareto front uh, analysis in some sense. All right, I see. Thanks for the, the clarifications on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I don't know if there's maybe one quick question from the audience before switching to Ignacio's presentation. I'll wait for a few seconds. All right, so I, I think there's no more questions. And I'll thank you again, Burak. Uh, yeah, um, I also wanted to, to thank all the speakers for their very nice uh, contributions. But uh, again, the, the spotlight goes to our graduating uh, students, Elias. Uh, Gilles and Yuting, it's been a, a great pleasure to, to work with you and I'm very proud of uh, the things you've achieved and I wish you the best in your, your next steps. Ignacio also uh, extremely impressive stuff, so, so I'm very proud to, to have worked with you in the past and hope to be able to work with all of you guys in the future. Um, and also, maybe really quickly, a, a very big thanks to the core ecosystem. So UC Levan has created this incredible environment where academics, um, industry, policy makers come together and uh, really interesting stuff happens in energy. So uh, congratulations, Ilyas, uh, Gilles and Yuting, and uh, let's hope we'll have many more of these nice events with our future graduating students. Take care, everybody. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Congrats, guys. Thank you, Anthony. Bye bye.